Welcome to the Surfcast Podcast, your weekly source for surf fishing discussions, tactics, interviews, news, and more. The Surfcast Podcast is hosted by Jerry Audette and Toby Lipinski, two of the most dedicated and obsessed surf fishermen that you will ever meet. The tide is up, the wind is at our back, so let's hit the surf. Welcome to a very special episode of the Surfcast Podcast, part two of an interview with Frank and Joyce Daniel. Now let's join Jerry Audette and Toby Lipinski as they pick up where they left off in part one. So, so let me ask you. Sure. When you stopped, was it because you could no longer sell? Was that a big, like, why did you stop? Because you kind of stopped, right? You did the salmon thing, but even then you really stopped fishing. It really. stopped. The moratorium, in spite of the fact that some people were violating it, I didn't want to violate it. Mm -hmm. So that's why we went salmon fishing. When we came back from salmon fishing, mm -hmm. I think we did about, what, three or four years of that? They, they dropped the moratorium, but, they, but you couldn't sell them. Mm -hmm. So selling fish was a big uh, incentive. Mm. We made a lot of money. Yeah. As a matter of fact, may I don't I, have figures for that. Frank, course. Frank, may I interrupt? Oh, yeah. please. Okay. Never mind the moratorium. Never mind the money. Up until four or five years ago, we were still fishing regularly mm -hmm. every tide in a secret place in Rhode Island. Now, if I told you, you know what I would have to do. <laughs> yeah, 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 don't tell us. Yeah, right, yeah. But it was an outflow, and he had it timed to the minute. Mm -hmm. This is fly fishing mm -hmm. at night. So we were leaving home at midnight, going through Providence, coming back with commuter traffic, catching fish every night, releasing them or keeping one for the table. Okay. We did that for as long as we could physically do it. Money was not involved. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So does that? Yeah. Yes. So you still got out. You still had. The, there was still a motivation even it was beyond still it fun. too. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Still having fun. Right. I, I can. I can see it. Well, I, you know, the money at one time, but then there was the fun of the fishing. So there's. It's. It was still all there. It was just different. One of the yeah. big. One of the big incentives that, at that period you were talking about in Rhode Island is that taking the pictures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. We took a lot of pictures. Yeah. Fly fishing. We had a spot. If you got there at, let's say, low tide was 6 o'clock in the morning. That was my favorite. High tide was at 12. If you got there at 2, it'd be outflowing like mad. And we'd walk in the back in the current and we would, we would throw from me to you, let it swing. Take a foot off, throw again, let it swing. Take another foot, what are we doing? We're doing concentric circles, right, the two of us. Eventually, because they're laying in the current somewhere. Mm. You'll find them. <laughs> you're going to find them. Yeah. Okay. Like a grid system. And <laughs> I had a camera with a, with a, uh, a flasher on it, flash one. Yeah. Flash. Yeah. And uh, I kept it on the bridge abutment, on a on a little shelf. You know how the bridges are made with bases. I kept the camera there, and if one of us caught a fish, we photographed the shit out of it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's because I knew, by then I was I had been writing quite a while. I knew the value. Mm -hmm. of of good film. Mm. When you're a writer and you don't take pictures, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> you gotta take pictures. So I fish <laughs> Did you hear that Toby? Yeah I know. Did you hear it? <laughs> Did you hear that Toby? I want to make sure. <laughs> yep. Yeah I've been so I, I I built up a huge library. I have thousands of pictures. Pictures of everything. Can we tell you something crazy? Huh? I'm, I'm going to tell you something crazy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to bust Toby's chops here for a second. 
Toby got his first official 50. Official 50 this year. Yeah. And he didn't oh, take, really? And he didn't take a photo. Huh? He didn't take a photo. He just let it go. He never oh, yeah, took a photo. Yeah. He just let it go. Yeah, he had to. Well, even didn't even bother taking it to shore, get setting up to take the photo. No photo. Yeah. He has no photo of no, it. No. <laughs> no uh, what other fish you had? That you had uh, two high 40s that, that yeah. week, roughly, too. No photos. Mm-hmm. To, I mean, we, we, so, the thing that's so different from fishing the Cape, and one of the reasons I love fishing the Cape, is because you can get away from people. It doesn't, you could have 500 anglers out there, and you can still get away. You can still get away from people, especially if you're willing to walk, that kind of thing. But for us, in the other places that we fish, all the other New England states, you have to be so careful with other people finding your spots. Mm. So, and I'm putting words in your mouth. No, but there. the reason Toby didn't take a photo is because the spot was more important to him than the 50. Yeah, the risk of someone seeing the event, you know, the photo, identifying it from the photo, seeing me take the photos, etc. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's a different world, isn't it? Uh -huh. yeah, it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you had a lot of people trying to figure out where you were doing, screw you up, interfere with you, trying to ruin your name even, right? I mean, all of those things were constant for you. The one that I write about in Sneaking is that they what they did was we catch a fish, it was on an honor system. Take it to the dock, we weigh it. Well, we got sometimes 10 fish. We weigh the 10 of them, we write them up on a slip, and put the slip on a desk. The, guy, the, the sneakers, they come up after you're gone, and they just go through the slips to see who caught what. They're not looking for Frank Down, although they stop. They slow down when they get to Frank Daniel. Yeah, right. And of course, critics of Frank Daniel say, he's a fucking army. You got six of, there's six of them fishing. And they were right. Mm -hmm. Right? But Frank Daniel, Frank Daniel had slips with 900 pounds. Yeah. That's right. Guy fishing by himself we had a slip for 60 pounds. Did the competition aspect of it matter to you? You liked the competition? It's about the. No, I didn't no, like the you didn't competition. like the competition. What, what was bad was that the money, the money, everybody was after the money. They weren't after the fish, they were after the money. Yeah. Soured it. Soured the experience with some. Yeah. 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 Interesting. But I mean, I always, at the, towards the end, it was a little bit of both. It was enjoyable, but it was the money. We had $10,000 summers. Back when I was working for 20. Right, mm -hmm. right. So with her salary as a teacher, 10th step, my salary as a 10th step teacher, and 10 grand on the beach, we were really, really packing in money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We put a lot of money away. This is a little bit too much money. I hope I shouldn't, maybe I shouldn't talk about it, but I saved it all. <laughs> and I, with today, let me see if I can explain some 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 of the metrics of money. Money doubles every seven years. The fish money was never spent, and thirty years have gone by, and the fish money has amounted to a million dollars. Wow! And that's. It's in, it's it's invested. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we, you're talking, you know, ten thousand dollars double, twenty, double, forty, double, eighty. Yeah, yeah. By the time you get through doing this for thirty years, you got a million dollars. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was your retirement account. Yeah. I mean, that's that's what a four hundred one k is essentially. <laughs> yeah. So more fun to get to and better returns. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's funny. How yeah. old was I when I retired? Fifty. Uh, you were fifty-two. Fifty-two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I retired at fifty-two. Yeah. With wow. a ton of money. Yeah, because of that. But he was writing full time. Yeah. 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 yeah writing as well. Yeah. So let me. Add, how do I phrase this? Um, 
So these days, you know, we're at a period where the striped bass is again in trouble. Um, we have like a pretty good population right now, sure. but the prevailing science, and pe some people disagree, but I think science is science, but the prevailing science is that we don't have a lot of fish behind them, so it's almost a little bit similar in some ways, but not as bad, not even close to as bad. As a moratorium situation, we have good fishing now, but we don't have anything behind it. How do you feel about, you know, no one can sell, um, there's not a culture of it anymore, nobody wants to sell. What do you think of any of that? Well, apparently the managers, the managers feel that selling them is an ex uh, is a uh, an incentive to kill the fish, and I can see that it wasn't that way when we were kids, you know. And if the, and when <clears throat> the fish started to become uh, a little bit scarcer, the price went up. So you still had the same mm -hmm. dollar, uh, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, dollar per pound or whatever. Yeah. But I haven't. We really haven't sold any fish since the close of the moratorium. Mm -hmm. For one thing, it was very heavily, when we came back from the moratorium, which was I think 83 or 86, we came back from salmon fishing. Uh, there was so much control on the striped bass, there was no point. And I, not only that, but our camper buggy was falling apart. Mm -hmm. It was uh, we blew out the man, blew out the manifold. <laughs> it sounded sound, yeah, yeah. it sounded like a like a monster truck. That's funny. That's funny. Can I ask? Um, this is a completely different different. Yeah, this is a completely different line of questioning. But so in my experiences on the Cape in the last, it's been fairly recent. We'll call it the last five years. I've been hooking bluefin tuna from the shore. And it often happens in a couple of specific places. And, I mean, they smoke me. I mean, they just, they take 600 yards of break. You know, I, can't, I don't even slow them down. Did you ever see anything like that? Did you ever hook any sharks or rays or anything? Did that ever really happen to you out there? No, we had one ray experience. That's the only one. I, that was during the Block Island thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's because I guess there's a lot of rays around Block Island. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the, so you never had any experiences in the Cape where you hooked anything like that? No. It's interesting. That was just curious. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, you, put, you, put, you, you hit it, just hit a button. Okay. We used, to line, we used to line up on a second rip. And uh, a school of uh, goosefish, you know those ugly things with mm -hmm. the, they come through and they take the plugs, you know. And these guys, they haul a goosefish up and they, gee, they're disappointed, so they kill it and let it lay on the sand. So one night, I think, I, I don't know how many bass I had, but I had reason to go to the dock. I picked up all the goosefish, took them to the dock. I got more money for the goosefish than I did to get the bass. <laughs> because because they, they're called tails. Mm -hmm. I guess the tails taste like lobster. I've heard well. that. That's I've eaten them, but I've heard that, yeah. So, from then on, I picked up all the goosefish. <laughs> Crazy things like that. That's uh, funny. That's a good story. What? Oh, here's another one. Uh -huh. Another story. We're fishing in Piton. The squid are washing up all over the beach. Squid everywhere, and I I thought it was kind of a phenomenon, so I bang on the door. I said, I said to the girls, "Come on, I want you to help me pick up some squid for bait." Oh yeah, pick it up. Now they're holding the squid at each other and squirting ink at each other. <laughs> there were miles of squid. So I says, "Here, here, here, take this cooler," and they fill up the cooler. I says, huh? I says, okay, girls, we're we're good, we're good, good. Don't no, don't take any more. And they're squirting at each other, for ink all over their pajamas. We took them in a town. We got five cents a pound for fifty. For it was a hundred pounds. 
for five, you got a hundred pounds of squid for five, at five cents a pound, five bucks. More uh, Tootsie Rolls and, and licorice. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Did it ever get hard? I mean, it's an amazing experience, and I can't imagine being a kid and living in the buggy. But did it ever get hard? Like, was it ever, you know, did you get sick of each other? Was it, you know, no, you didn't. No. No. The only thing, the only thing that I thought was very good for them, is uh, remember the TV? We had a little black and white TV about this big. Mm -hmm. Okay. Alice, how would you like to be the first woman astronaut <laughs> on TV? And the kids are they're all watching TV, watching black and white, tiny little TV. black and white yeah. TV. And I have to go outside and turn the antenna. Get it just well, right. We, we wouldn't get any re any reception if I didn't. <laughs> and the kids really like the t having a TV on the beach. Oh, yeah. The little TV, that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> now, because you were, I think, I was just reading, you were like, oh, I got $1,500. And, like, that was, you know, a quarter of a for year. The cover, was yeah. it for the cover photo on Saltwater Sportsman? Like, it was like $1,500 for the first cover. And that's... I, I don't even get that. Yeah, I don't, don't even get that. Anymore. I sold a lot of covers for Saltwater Sportsman, mm -hmm. but when they uh, they had a little dispute within the organization, Wilma was a a dyed in the wool surf casting person, and he he did very little fishing in a boat. He was definitely a surf caster, and the high command. Beyond Wolna was looking at sales, advertising sales for Grady White's full page money. There's no money in surf writing. The money is in boat writing. Mm -hmm. And so w Wolna's heart was in the surf casting. So he was kind of, they loved him, but they had to shove him aside. And he was coming down to retirement anyway. So... You know, he, he finally left them, mm -hmm. and when Wilma left them, I lost my my connection with Saltwater Sportsman because I'm a Wilma made me, and we were uh, I was a journalistic house pet, and and with Wilma gone, I lost my connection. Yeah. So. It's the same way now, nowadays, with the magazine world. It's the exact same thing I, I, I dealt with. It's Jerry's where the money is. With. The money is yeah. in these full-page Grady Whites, not a not a, a plug. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know? That's right. It, it, but then the passion, there's passion, obviously, on both sides, but the passion of the surfcaster doesn't pay the bills to run the magazine yeah, the exactly. same that the passion of the exactly. boat sales does. And, it's and a, uh... Wilna taught me a great deal about writing. Wilna once told me that he was the agent for the reader, and he says, I want you to remember that, because he says, if you can't do, do things that please the reader, you got nothing. So you're, re you're working for the reader, and you're working for me because I'm watching you for the reader. <laughs> Wilma, right. Wilma told, taught me so much. Wilma bought my first story and gave me my first rejection. <laughs> In which order? <laughs> yeah. Uh, that, no, I sold the story first. Okay. Nice. And the funny thing is, is that my critics say, Dano's never been to Block Island because we had it all to ourselves. We never saw Dano. Dano's first story in 1970 was called Block Island Safari. Mm -hmm. These guys weren't even born. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> they didn't right? even know it existed. And Dano's never been to Block Island. All right? <laughs> That's funny. And uh, I was doing all my sales to Wilma. And then eventually he retired. And uh, I stopped getting... Nice letters from him. <clears throat> I, I, I didn't get the advice slowly petered out. Wilna was getting old, and uh, eventually, after he retired, he died. Mm. But I loved Wilna. Mm -hmm. Wilna taught me everything.
taught me absolutely everything. Yeah, Woolner well, and, and Lyman, they and, were and, still. And the, the other thing is, is that latch on to the people who help you the most. You just can't help it. You need them. Right there. Okay? You're pointing to your wife. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 My wife... I had, used to have guys walk up to me on Cape Cod. Hey, Dano, do you realize how lucky you are? All right? And I said, oh, no, I never heard that before. <laughs> <laughs> okay? And the high command, Joyce, does everything for me. I tell her, especially lately, because... I've really lost a lot of, a lot of. Uh, the funny thing is, is that I can't do anything but write. Everything else is all screwed up. Mm. Let me ask you a question. Sure. All of those years of fishing, huh? yeah. all of those late nights, all yeah. of that hard work. You know, a lot of people would view that as, you know, you really beat your body up. You know, you really, you really. Wow. Do you think that's true, or do you think it's got you to eighty-seven? My know? mother. That's right. My mother used to say in September when we came back, because don't forget, we went to the beach for 10 weeks. No job to go to on a week, during a week, none of that. We had a buggy. We, 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 the six of us lived in a buggy. And I'd get, I'd get home in September, and my mother would say, this is when I was 35 or 40 years old. I, Francis, you've lost a lot of weight. You might have cancer. <laughs> so... I tried to make my mother understand that, you know, fishing all night every night, I, lo I lost weight. I also made a lot of money, mm -hmm. a ton of money, a ton. In those days, it was legal, and it was proud. You were putting food on people's tables. I mean, today's, t today's uh, the way this t t the culture is today, you're, you're murdering the finest fish in the world. And that's all changed. But also, when they, when they went to protecting striped bass and, ki and kill commercial fishing, we went salmon fishing in Maine. Mm -hmm. Because we loved, loved the glory, but we didn't, we didn't have to make any more money. Can we talk about money? Yeah. Can we talk about anything you want? Back in the commercial days, We used to get like, we started, when we started selling fish, if there was a lot of bass, we got 20 cents a pound. But it started to, I don't know if it was inflation or the loss of striped bass, but we ended up at 250 a pound. So, and they were all 40 pounders. That's $100 a fish with four kids catching them. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, now, in 2023, that would be a lot of money. You know? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. so we started making tons of money fishing. And with her salary as a teacher, which that's another story that I, I went to bat for her. We, we got, I got a lot of stories. <laughs> She was supposed to go to, to Rhode Island College and, and learn to be a teacher. And Dickie was coming. He, w he wasn't going to college either because he was only this big. <laughs> he wasn't ready. <laughs> so I felt bad afterwards. Once the kids were big enough to go to school, I said, I got to get her in college, but I got to trick her into it because she won't go. So I said... I said to her, I said, I have a Dr. Matt Burke in child psychology. I said, it's be good for you because you've got a lot of kids. Why, why don't you come? I asked Dr. Burke if, uh, if she could audit the class. She said, yeah, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go with you. And I had child psychology with Dr. Burke. And who's sitting on the windowsill was her. And she was fascinated. I knew she was going to bite. 
So we get all done. She says, oh, what a life that would be. I said, why don't you write your servant? Go to Rhode Island College. We can't afford it. We'll find a way, I said. I worked two jobs to get her and me, because don't forget, I didn't have a degree either. So we both went to Rhode Island College and both got our degrees the same day. When we retired, or not retired, when we graduated from Rhode Island College with our degrees in education, uh, our children were at the, uh, at the, at the, uh, the ceremony, huh? Mm, that's great. And her parents, her parents who said that Dana will never amount to anything. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's funny. And that's amazing. That's great. That's great. The only place we ever separated was, I, I signed up for the master's degree in industrial education. And she went to Providence College. We both got our master's degrees in education. Joyce, when you were uh, all summer long uh, in the camper, see Frank and the kids, are, you all are fishing, would you make friends with some of the other wives at times from some of the anglers? Because I'm sure they weren't fishing Barbara, with Barbara. their husbands. Barbara, yeah, oh, very few, Yeah, very few. Now, what did, you know, maybe during the winter when you were back home, did the other families look at your family in like a different way because you know you took the family up to the cape you dragged them on the beaches all summer long i just can see how some people can look upon other people in certain ways and assumptions or did you did any of your friends back home ever confront you on that or discuss it or they just kind of looked at it as normal that the daniels just that's what they do they go to the cape for the summer and they it fish. was our lifestyle and yeah. they seem to have accepted it that's the way i remember it yeah that's that's why I always wondered that how exactly if it was accepted of yeah. your non summertime families and friends that you had because yeah. I think today as I look back to the life that we exposed our children to today we would be highly criticized because they had a lot of freedom mm -hmm. uh, they fished at night as you as you realize um, on the weekends when other families came. They socialized with the other kids on the beach, so we didn't encourage or force them mm -hmm. to fish. That was their social time. Mm. During the week, we were alone, you know. But today, we would be highly criticized. I could, I could see that. <laughs> yeah. In fact, even back then, there were some who criticized us. Yeah. But, it but was, the kids turned out fine, and everything, or even more than fine. They're capitalistic, I think. But <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure. It, in general, now they look back fondly upon oh. these times. That you, I mean, to have the kind of time spent with family growing up. I think the teenage years, in all honesty, had to have been difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, our middle child uh, left first, and today she would give. She's sixty-three. She would give anything to spend a night on the Cape, on the beach. Mm -hmm. So cow. they have the fond, a cow? yeah, fond, fond memories of that life, that style. But I, I also realize that I don't know if I have regrets because they weren't on any street corner corner during the summer. They were with us, mm -hmm. you know. So I, I, you know, I guess in all in all, it turned out okay. Yeah, yeah. like I said, to have the you know, the wonderful family experiences like that. You know, I look back, I'm sure Jerry's you know, growing up, those experiences you had with the family, you guys had it. I would go to the beach for a weekend. You guys would go and be together the entire summer doing those things. So it's it's oh. it's really, you know, it's beautiful to, to they had that and were able to experience it the way you guys were able to. So I would, like I said, I always wondered how that worked outside of just your family. So that's I, a... I can't imagine. I would I would have loved it. I mean, I was... I was weird amongst my friends anyways. I was always in the woods by myself, digging under logs and playing think, in the brook or I whatever. I think that uh, I loved it. money is a big incentive for everything. It, it, it really does. It does, it does uh, generate interest. Because especially if you're from, from a background where you were really poor, you know? And well, we, and you guys worked hard. I mean, fishing is fun. But you guys worked hard. Mm -hmm. It was hard yeah. work. We too. went beyond, but we, the money, the money was, 
like my mother said, Francis, I think you got cancer, you know? <laughs> we, I, I mean, I really kill myself. Yeah. And I, did you lose any weight? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was my weight control. <laughs> but in, don't forget, now, be, besides the summertime, we were still fishing weekends, spring and fall. Mm -hmm. So we'd get out of school Friday afternoon, head for the beach, fish until Sunday night, and if we were doing well, early Friday or early Monday morning, arrange for somebody else to take our fish in. And he used to say, I hope nobody chews gum in your class today. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I could see that. If I do one or two nights in a row, I, I, yeah. always, I always feel Joe, bad for anyone Joe at work. Crow, <laughs> Joe Crowder used to take our Monday, our Monday fish in. Yeah, that, I didn't remember who. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the thing yeah. is, when, you're, when you know your patience is very short, that's when you're the most patient because you have to compensate for mm -hmm. it, yeah. you know. But we had to get back to money, twenty five hundred dollar weekends. Yeah. And so we were supplementing our income. And he mentioned earlier, when we married in nineteen fifty seven, we were poor. And to not be poor anymore was pretty nice. Mm -hmm. An amazing feeling. Yeah. 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 American dream. You made something yourselves. You did what you could together, and again, adding in, you were able to do it as a family and yeah. collectively make things better all around for you. It was great. I mean, yeah. twenty five hundred dollars a week. I'd take that today. <laughs> <laughs> I would yeah. not balk at that. <laughs> yeah. Is there anything? I guess before we kind of get to the end, is there anything else that either of you want to talk about or discuss or mention from? Either the times when you guys were fishing like that, or Frank, some of the anything else you want to discuss about evolving into the writing that it eventually became. Is there any other points that you'd like well, to? Muff Prayer was uh, a guy from Warwick that used to come on the beach with a camper that I met on Norset. Was the first time I was on Norset, and uh, Muff was very competitive. He was a good fisherman, and we were rim fishing on the bottom in those days. I'm the one that, well, I don't know if I actually did bring it to him, but I changed my fishing on Norset. Everybody on Norset was soaking worm, sea worms, mm. and I went to, I went to plugs. And uh, I, I think there were a couple of other guys that, that did some plugging. Uh, that guy from Boston, he plugged. The guy that had the camp on, 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 on Norset. Doesn't matter. Ed McCule. Oh, okay. Good for you. He plugged. Mm -hmm. But there was nobody plugging in those days. But I, and when I started plugging, I met Ed McCule. He was a plugger. Mm -hmm. And once I, once I realized that we could catch more fish with plugs than we could with sea worms. See, the trouble with sea worms is they put them on the bottom and they wait. And it's so slow that they actually have two rods with sea worms. I gaffed a 55 pounder from a friend of mine who caught it on a sea worm. I weighed it. Yeah? Yeah. So they work, but it's not as a, not as efficient. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I think that... Uh, I thought that plug, plug, and, plug and move, plug and move until you find a fish was very, very effective, and nobody was doing that mm. at Norset. And when we got to P-Town, we were in paradise because that's what they did in P-Town. Nobody fished bait in Piton, mm -hmm. but in Austin they were fishing bait, but that slowly evolved into bait into uh, plugs. Also, the plug that revolutionized plug fishing was a rebel. Not the sinker, that's a dog. Mm -hmm. The floater rebel. All our girls' biggest fish, which were all in the mid to upper forties, were all caught on rebels. It's what the New Yorkers call a girly plug. And anybody that fished with a rebel was a sissy. <laughs> what they produced. <laughs> she got her she got her fifty pounder on a rebel on a rebel floater rebel. Uh, a, oh that's another thing. Not loaded rebels, floater rebels. I hate lead in a plug. Mm -hmm. That's how I feel about the red fin. I feel like I feel the red fin needs to be unloaded. I will load mine. Because sometimes you need distance, but if there's any way I could fish it with no weight in it, that's what I want to do, for sure. I agree. Yeah. So nobody fishes rebels anymore. They don't. No, 
Very Nobody true. does. Yeah. And I and I don't what know. What are they fish with? I mean, on the Cape, on the Cape these days, I would say most guys are fishing needlefish. Needle. Eel? Needle. Needle. Oh, needlefish. Needlefish. Yeah, yeah that, that's what they're doing most. on the Block Island too. Yeah. Yeah. Or, I would say, as far as swimmers, I mean, oh, the, swimmers the, the SP minnow, everybody likes that. The SP the, minnow um, has become a big thing. What was the Yozuri that I was throwing? This, the hy- hydro minnow. Yeah, the that thing, works the well. Thing that, bombers. Uh, bombers. Bombers are pretty the popular. The thing that we thought we brought to fishing, which is really not original for, for Frank and Joyce, was uh, the teaser. Mm-hmm. That we, we were so fond of teasers that if there was a strong wind that night, and the plug was being held back, we put a sinker on the on where the plug was and, and, and just let the teaser catch the fish, and it did. That is one of the most... Every time I think about you, that's like one of the stories I think about. Because I think about that all the time for a couple of reasons. First, I, I had never really thought about it. Like, I'd never really thought about putting a bank sinker on, attaching it to a teaser, and just bombing it out there. Because there are nights where me and my friends... We will not fish because the wind is just so strong. I mean, even you can't even bucktail it. There's nothing you could do. You know, when it's when it's a constant forty, it's pretty hard to fish. They're still there, but they're still there. That's the thing, right? And it always makes me question. But the other thing is, Frank, I can't fish teasers. I've tr- I have. I've even written an article about them because I used them in an estuary. I had done that where you know people always think of the sand beach thing, but you can fish it. You know, in current, anyway. because essentially you're fly fishing without the fly rock, right? Mm-hmm. But I need, to, like, <laughs> you guys fish teasers so much, and there's still plenty of people who fish teasers on the Cape. Most of them are the, the next generation between me and you. They're, like, in between. But most of the guys my age, they don't really fish teasers. And I don't know why. Because they're so, I mean, look, Tony caught his world record on the teaser, right? And I don't know why. And you had such great success with the teaser, Right? I mean, you felt like it, it was naked without it, right? It had One of the things that happened is the reason why we used a fly for a teaser is we already knew that the fish were going to take flies. So if we couldn't fly fish, we could put a sinker in front of the teaser, the fly teaser, mm-hmm. and still fish, still catch fish. Frank Bobless, which is a very dear friend of mine, was not a fly fisherman. So he would take a he would take a rebel, which I recommended, and I would take a fly. And I would catch two to his one with the rebel. When you do the bank sinker thing, yeah. I mean, do you just throw it out there and retrieve it? I mean obviously I know you're fishing in You're pretty- fishing a teaser. You fish the teaser the the same way. Mm-hmm. You fish a bank sinker the same way. But yes. it's rough water. And mm-hmm. the, rut, the, the stripers are in rough, like rough water. They love the rough water, yeah. So you're literally just casting it out and retrieving it mm-hmm. with the bank sinker. That's a, I mean, that's crazy. I, I've thought tape. about it, but I never have when I've been out. But it, it different. you guys were out there for an extended amount of time. You needed to find a way, if it was blowing for three or four days, to do mm-hmm. something other than just sit in your buggy all night. So mm-hmm. it makes sense you would then figure it out we talked uh, you, you talked about the the rebel being you know the plug that was used obviously i mean it got me fishing them i have a collection of them now because of wanting to fish them and you know i go to the cape and i always bring one to try to catch them just because like that connection to your writing but a lot of one of the other plugs you spoke of a lot was the giant pikey now i had two sides of the question because there's the giant pikey there's the straight version and then the giant jointed and guess which one was it? And was the it was jointed? It was the giant jointed, and I I don't know if it was just crossing the wires in my head or what ha- was. Did you actually fish it, or did you just talk about that other people were fishing it at, 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 at times? You want to see some? I, I have one. I mean, I I I, I just I can never I, I have out. at least four. So you did fish them, and was it? It's such a stark contrast to the Rebel. I mean, they, they are such different lures. What would prompt you on a given day to clip or night to clip on one versus the other? We had a joke on a beach. When you catch a fish this big on a, on a plug that was that big, we'd say, that fish wasn't eating it. It was doing something else with it. We, <laughs> we say that still, yes. It probably came from the writing. The, the Rebel was... Uh, the, the giant pikey 
was a marvelous plug. Mm -hmm. Marvelous plug. One of my favorites. The only thing is, is that it <coughs> you don't want to use it in a, on a night that there's fire, because mm -hmm. it turns up a ton of fire. Yeah. And it may it looks like a it looks like a baseball bat, or more. Yeah. A canoe. A canoe. Yeah, a canoe. That was one of the one of your phrases in the book. A yeah. canoe paddle being chased by a canoe. Those are yeah. my favorites that you said. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But it's a great plug. Yeah, yeah. so there was, uh, uh, it wasn't something that you had disdain for. It was on the positive side. You really liked yeah. it. Some of the guys used to call it the Big Mama. Mm-hmm. Interesting. It's a, it's a, it's a great lure. Mm. Yeah. Great lure. Now, I got with, a bunch of them. With the, I mean, the primary, primarily it's the sand deals you're replicating with the, the Rebel and obviously with the teasers. What do you think... You might have been replicating with the giant pike, or was it just the fish were feeding on it, and you know we're feeding? And then I think the latter. I think the fish. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Didn't didn't get into it. They just didn't and want to question. We it. had this constant changing of the love of fish. I think it was psychological more than the reality of fishing. Mm -hmm. One year, I, I I got that feeling when I read that what's his name's book. Uh, about the, the pencil popper on a on on Block Island. It became the thing to do on Block Island. Mm. And a rebel became that thing to do if you were a Dino. And she got she got her fifty pounder on a wind cheater. Mm hmm Yeah? Mm. But, yeah, so you think sometimes plugs are more about fads than they are really about the fish. It's a little bit of both. Yeah. I know that Many times we've been fishing and we were we were not doing very well and we changed and we did better. And sometimes I think we did worse. I, I, you know, I, there are a lot of, lot of unanswered questions in, fish, in surf casting, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they do. For instance, the pencil popper. I never did well with it. That's the one that they loved on law on Block Island. I, you couldn't get arrested with my life with the pencil popper. Yeah, we're we're not lovers of the pencil popper really either. Not that we do much daytime. Yeah, fishing, we don't really. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We're not experts, but yeah, we, I don't. I'm not a big. If I'm if I'm going to fish during the day, I like a big walk the dog lure. But we don't really fish during the day. I rare rarely if ever. Yeah, but those so. didn't those guys on Block Island fish at night. With the pencil? With anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 they did. Yeah, they definitely. So, Frank, last question. <laughs> what do you think is your surf casting legacy? Like, what do you think, what would you like it to be? What would you like to be known for? You know, what is it that you think you're known for? Well, I'd like to be remembered as a, a great fisherman, a great surf caster, you know, something... Something like Lee Wolf with salmon. When you talk Atlantic salmon, it's Lee Wolf. Mm -hmm. And the world will always remember Lee Wolf for that. And I would like to be uh, the Lee Wolf of striper fishing, you know? Yeah. Uh, I, I wish, the reason why we go hunting is Surf casting is too difficult, it's too demanding. Hunting is a sissy game, <laughs> which is what we are reduced to. Go look in my office, there's nothing but antlers on the walls. Mm -hmm. Joyce gets one wall and I get the other, and we have equal numbers of antlers. Yeah. We have to hunt because we can't fish. So that's what's left of our, our legacy. Well, I think the writing is a phenomenal legacy. I mean, mm -hmm. I think for me, when I read your, when I read your writing, you were one of the first ones that I connected to in that you're not just, and there's been lots of people since, and there were people before, but you weren't just giving instruction. You were connecting me to my feelings about the surf. You wrote about how you felt about it. Mm -hmm. That's what I, when I read your stuff, are you I got acquainted, a feeling. Are you acquainted with Kib Ramhall? No. And I know of, of Kip. Yeah, on, lives on the vineyard, correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, he's a, he's a, 
he used to be the advertising manager mm-hmm. for Solar Sportsman. Yeah. Bram Hall, every spring, writes to me and says, I did my annual reading of 20 years on the Cape just before I start fishing. He says, it pumps up my, it yeah. pumps me up. That's right. Mm-hmm. And Bram Hall is a pro. Yeah. He's a, he's a, a vineyard highliner and very respected. And by the way, he's written a couple of books and I have them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I will tell you, I took my dad surf fishing for the first time ever this spring, this summer. And actually he came at the perfect time because the fish were in on the Cape and it was phenomenal. I mean, we had just an absolute ball, but we fished all night multiple times. I couldn't get him off the beach. I was like, dad, you know, I think probably fish another 45 minutes. It's like two 30, you know, in the morning. And he's like, do we have to leave? And I'm like, well, no, no, we don't. I just figured you might want to, you know, but I woke up the first morning after we fished the first night to find him sitting on the couch reading 20 years on the Cape. And he was like, this is fantastic. And he doesn't really read books so much. Um, and he had never been surf fishing until the night before. And he loved it. He said he was reading through 20 years on the Cape and he was absolutely loving it. And he goes, this is some of the places we went. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's right. And then we went back the next night. I, I think, re- you know, regarding that, that, that's a beautiful legacy. I agree with it that, you know, like Jerry said, there's a connection that I had that many anglers had to your experiences, the way that you wrote them between your articles, your books. I mean, I, I still read 20 years on the Cape every year as well. Whether I'm, if I ever, you know, I, maybe not to start my season, but at some point during the year, I'll read through it. I might flip through it. It's on my desk at work all the time. I need a little inspiration, motivation, get my head back in. I'll open up and read a chapter. And if I'm going to the Cape, I flip back through it again, and to have that kind of lasting, just uh, a power, I think it, it is a beautiful. You know what's thing. interesting? The article, the fishing contest. I sold that three times, and told the editor every time. I said, "Well, give me, let me have a look at it," and I get they get back to me and say, "I'll take it." <laughs> three times, and it was submitted to the Outdoor Writers of America. And it came in second. In the New England Outdoor Writers, it came in first. And I got a nice plaque. Plaque. Well, I think uh, for Toby and I, your writing has been very significant mm-hmm. in our lives. Why do people identify more with 20 years on the Cape as opposed to Eastern Tides? Because they're both anecdotal. I, I enjoyed them both. I I'm trying to think. It, it, I, I see that, it, and I was. I went through. I was trying to find a couple of quotes last night. So I actually, like, I was telling Jerry, I like speed read through all of the books, trying to find a couple of little things that were, you know, bounced around the back of my head, and it reminded me how much I did like and do like Eastern Tides. But there's just maybe because Twenty Years on the Cape was the first book that I held in my hand to that style. Uh, the way, again, there, there's the romanticism about the entire experience, and, and there's just some connection that it is made. I mean, the, yeah, I they are similar. Yeah, I never really thought about it. Well, in 89, when he wrote, wrote 20 Years, that was his first book. By the time he wrote East and Tides, in my opinion, he was a better writer. Mm-hmm. So, to me, East and Tides is better written than 20 Years. However, I think yeah, I won't argue with that. Yeah, twenty years came from his heart, mm-hmm. and maybe that's what makes the difference. Yeah, I'm just wondering. I know how I feel. I'm just wondering how people like you feel, and why. You know. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I really like Striper Surf too. Oh, mm-hmm. well, that's yeah. his Bible. Yeah, when I was looking through it again, that one because I went through all of them last night. Yeah. I hadn't actually opened up Striper Surf in a while, and it was bringing back memories of reading it, and I. I I made a note to so we're going to go through this again this winter. It's I, when I get home, it's going to go to the, my re, you know I went to reading list mm-hmm. because I had not looked through them all because I always just automatically jump back to twenty years for whatever that yeah. that reason is. But they're all they're all wonderful. <laughs> well, I I mean I'd like to just thank again both of you for taking your time today. Yes, so thank you so thank much. Thank you, Frank. Really appreciate you taking the time out of your day, and uh, I mean, this has been. I enjoyed it. Wonderful. I enjoyed talking about it.
This has been a weekly edition of the Surfcast podcast. You can find out more about the podcast and find more episodes at surfcastpodcast.com. And be sure to check us out on social media at the Surfcast podcast.